How do you build a great church? We aren't talking bricks and stained glass windows. I mean, if you could create an amazing church, what would it look like? Most would say it has to be friendly, caring, somewhere where you feel known, more like a community or even family. It has to be excited about serving. Churches just don't happen. It's all hands on deck, come early, stay late, whatever it takes type attitudes. Churches thrive when people give of their time and talents and resources, wholeheartedly investing them in the kingdom of God. But a church isn't just some volunteer organization. It is a Holy Spirit-led movement to change the world. This movement advances by us sharing Jesus both near and far, by sowing and going. A great church has to swing for the fence. It's got to be willing to do things a little different and dream a little bigger. It can't just focus on where it's at, but where it's going. There has to be a God-given hunger that there is more to be accomplished. Society is tired of fake. A church has to be real and relatable. Broken people restored by God's amazing grace. When you are a part of a great church, you don't just go, you grow. It's not about attending a service, but being part of a team. Everyone together growing to know God more. You see, a church helps people find a real relationship with a real God. You can build a great church if you remember who the builder is. Jesus said, I will build my church. Peter said, each of us are living stones. So how do you build a great church? Let's find out. Well, good morning, WCAG family. So great you guys came that we could connect today. And uh, man, we're excited. We got our Fairview campus that is going right now uh, at the same time of this service. So God's doing incredible things. Guys, I believe that God is positioning us as a church to accomplish more than we could ever ask or imagine. And we are in our fall building block series uh, this fall here. Um, We talk about how WCAG is a great church. And so regardless of whether you attend here in Watford City, uh, attend uh, online in Fairview or just online wherever you're at right now across the nation. Talked to a lady today. She said, we visit here in the summers, but in the wintertime, we're from Seattle, Washington. I believe that's where she said. She said, we watch WCAG online every Sunday. So it's just great to know that we got people uh, whose lives are being impacted all around the nation uh, today. So hey guys, we're excited to get into our uh, building block series once again. Got to give a quick disclaimer this morning. I know that we're talking about how um, WCAG is a great church. At the same time, I want to make sure that everyone in the room understands that we are not perfect, okay? I know. If you were looking for a perfect church, you came to the wrong place. All right. We're not perfect. By no means are we perfect. We're going to fall short all the time, but that's why when we talk about these building blocks, each Sunday we talk about that this is an important piece to a healthy and vibrant church, so we just don't want to stay where we're at as a church, but we want to continue to grow. We want to continue to get better at all of these aspects of the building blocks. So we're going to jump into building block number three. Can you guys say this word with me? It's generosity. Let's say that again. Generosity. That's what we're talking about this morning. Guys, I think that um, it's really important to get the elephant out of the room right away. If Pastor Sheldon's talking about generosity, that means the church wants Money, you guys answered it wrong, that's right. Uh, Money, everybody thinks immediately when you talk about generosity, then the church wants money. And so throughout our American culture right now, there is this terrible, terrible thought process in people's minds that they are saying the church is just out to get your money. Can I just tell you right now, I don't want your money. I don't need your money, okay? Um, That's me personally, (laughs) okay? The the church, obviously, the church needs resources to function, to keep the lights on, all of those type of things. And like we talked about last week, the church is an incredible world, really, that functions the way that it does. We talked about last week, service. 98% of the people who serve in the local church do not get any remuneration whatsoever. Another thing about uh, the the church is that the church actually functions 100% on people's willingness to give. 
We don't sell a product. We don't, we don't try and turn something around so that we can get resources. It literally, this is one of the few organizations on the planet that literally runs off the generosity of a group of people. And so this morning, as we talk about generosity, we understand that this can be kind of a, a buzz topic within the church because there are people that have a wrong view of this. Now, here's the thing. I believe in giving people incredible opportunities to give and to sow their resources into what God wants to accomplish. God honors generosity, uh, but we never ever want anyone anyone to ever walk out the doors of this building or one of our campuses or online, we never want anyone to ever have that weight and that burden feeling yucky inside going, I feel like someone was just trying to get something from me. We don't ever want anyone to feel that way. So oftentimes, when we're receiving an offering at WCAG, we're very careful to say things like, Pastor Dustin said this many Sundays, where he'll say, you know what, if you're joining us and you're visiting this morning, please don't feel obligated to give in any fashion. We just want our, our people here at the church to, to be able to give in the offering today. Many times when we'll have missionaries or guest speakers or different things where we'll receive special offerings, we want to make sure that people understand you're in no obligation to give. We want to give an opportunity for those people who believe in what we're talking about today to give their resources generously. Because you know what? The Bible is very clear that God likes a certain kind of giver. He, he a certain kind of giver, okay? And some of you are thinking, oh, you mean like a big giver? No, that's not the kind of giver he wants. He, he loves a cheerful giver. Show me your cheerful giver face this morning. I know that's hard for some of you. You're like, yeah, it's been a while, you know, or something like that. But your cheerful giver face. God loves someone that says, I love to be generous and give towards the things that God is doing. So last week we talked about service and the importance of a sacrificial type mentality when it comes to service. It's so amazing that all of these building blocks kind of build on one another because that same mentality of sacrificial service also flows into service sacrificial generosity. So this morning, we're going to take our Bibles and we're going to look at generosity today. Take your Bibles and turn with me to Luke chapter 21 is where we're going to talk about or start with, and we're going to see that God loves and gets excited about generosity. Luke chapter 21, uh, if you don't have your Bible with you, it will be on the screen behind me this morning. Luke 21, we're going to read from the New Living Translation this morning. Whatever translation you have will work there. Just great. Luke 21, starting at verse 1, says this, While Jesus was in the temple, he watched the rich people dropping their gifts in the collection box. So let's stop here just real quick. So back in Jesus' time, they would have kind of like a collection plate that they would sit out, and as people are walking into the tabernacle or the temple there or the, basically the church, they would take out their resources in front of everyone. Can you imagine doing an offering like this? And they would put their money in the offering plate so that everyone can see. And so these people would dress up in these really nice clothes, and they would get a nice sack of gold coins or silver coins or something, and they would come by and make sure everyone was seeing them, and then they would put it in the offering plate. And they would walk in and they'd say, man, how good am I? Everyone gets to see my generosity. But Jesus sees someone in the next few verses and he says, that's not really generosity. He says, this is what true generosity is. He said that in verse one, he watched the rich people dropping their gifts in the collection box and really wasn't that impressed. But in verse two, it says this, then a poor widow came by and dropped two small coins, dropped in two small coins, Verse three, I tell you the truth, Jesus said, this poor widow has given more than all the rest of them. Now, wait a minute. That doesn't make a lot of sense. The rest of them were big, giving big sacks of money, so on and so forth. How could she be giving more than the rest of them? This is what Jesus says in verse four. For they have given a tiny part of their surplus, but she, poor as she is, has given everything she had. Jesus sees this widow is giving sacrificially. And people sometimes think that you have to be rich in order to be generous. But biblically, that is not the case. Jesus says that isn't the case. Jesus says this woman gave beyond what was left over. 
I love the fact that this story is included in the Bible because it shows us that God is excited when people give sacrificially or who are generous. God loves the understanding that, that people have when they say, every last penny of my resources, my house, my vehicle, all of the things that I have accumulated in this lifetime are really not mine, but rather I am a steward or I am a manager of these resources that God has given me. He says, I love that type of mentality. When people have that mentality, when this lady said the last two coins that she had, even up to the last two coins, these were actually God's, and she gives them in in that offering. Guys, generosity, here's the thing. If you're going to catch something, catch this this morning. Generosity is more a heart thing than it is a money thing. Generosity is more a heart thing than it is a money thing. Remember when I said, when we were talking about generosity, what are we talking about today? And everyone says, money. But really, generosity is more a heart thing than it is actually a money thing. Let's look at that. In Matthew chapter six, Jesus talks about this principle too. So let's flip over to Matthew chapter six this morning. Matthew chapter six, we'll look at verses 19 through 21. I'll give you just a couple seconds to get over there. Your electronic devices probably go faster than flipping, but Matthew 6, 19 through 21, it says this. This is that Jesus talking about our resources or the things that we have in this life. He says, don't store up treasures here on earth where moths eat them and rust destroys them and where thieves break in and steal. Store your treasures in heaven where moths and rust cannot destroy, and thieves do not break in and steal. Verse 21, he says, wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will also be. So Jesus here is talking about investment, and he is saying, as Christians, we need to be careful where we are investing our treasure, where we're investing our resources. And Jesus is saying, listen, don't focus all of your focal point and all of your time on investing in things of this world that ultimately will rust away, that will decay, that one day someone might steal from you. Invest your treasure in things that are important to heaven like things like people's lives being transformed with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because guys, I'm gonna tell you something. There's really, when you breathe your last breath, there is only one thing this side of heaven that you can bring with you. You wanna take a guess what it is? It's others. It's other people. That's the only thing you can bring with you. You can't bring all of the things that you've stored up. You can't bring up all of the stuff. You can't bring that stuff with you. It it doesn't even matter. At some point in this life, when you breathe your last breath, there is only one thing that matters, and that's other people. And so Jesus is saying, listen, be careful how you invest the resources and invest your life and your time and your talents and everything because Jesus makes a really odd statement in verse 21. He says that where your treasure goes, your heart will follow. It's an interesting statement because a lot of us would think, wait a minute, shouldn't it be the other way around, Jesus? Shouldn't it be where your heart goes, that's where your money goes? And Jesus was saying, listen, it's important where you invest your resources, it's important where you invest your time, it's important where you invest your talents, because ultimately, where you invest those things, your heart is chained to your investment. Your heart is attached to your investment, and it's going to go there. So listen, guys. Where is your heart going to go? Ultimately, when you say, listen, my heart is going towards the things of God, your heart will gravitate towards that. And that's why generosity actually grows in a person's life. Once you begin being generous, you want to be generous more. It just naturally happens because where your treasure goes, your heart is going there also. It's a biblical principle, guys. I tell this to married couples all the time. They'll, they'll come in, they'll say, Pastor Sheldon, we're, we're struggling. They'll talk to Pastor John now. They'll, they'll go into Pastor John and they'll say, hey, Pastor John and Naomi, we're struggling in our marriage. And when I, when I would talk to people, they'd say, we're struggling in our marriage. And, they would, and I would ask them, inevitably, it would come down to this question. I said, when was the last time you invested in your marriage? And they go, ooh. 
It's been a little while. I say, you know what? I'm going to tell you a secret. If you invest in your marriage, your feelings will come back because there's a biblical principle here. Where your treasure is or your investment is, your heart automatically follows. Your heart automatically follows. So we're getting a little off track. That's marriage counseling 101. You can take that for what it is. Generosity, that's where we're at. But where your treasure goes or your investment goes, your heart is automatically going to follow. Jesus says in verse 21, it's going to follow. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, Paul tells us that a craving for money can actually cause us to wander from the faith. That we can get to a place where we're so chasing after money that ultimately we wander from the faith. It becomes the most important thing in our lives and our time and our resources and our talent goes that way and our heart follows and we can wander from the faith. In 1 John 5.24 it says, Dear children, keep away from anything that might take God's place in your hearts. John was saying that we need to pay close attention to things that would try and push God out of the number one seat in our heart. Guys, selfishness is like poison to Christians. There's nothing more in opposition to Christ's love and God's grace than selfishness. Pastor Robert Morris wrote this. He said, nothing propels a believer in maturity and effectiveness in God's kingdom faster than learning to be unselfish. Remember last week when I said one of the ways that you can grow in your spiritual maturity is through service? You know, another way that you can grow in your spiritual maturity is through generosity. Because doing that, what it does is when you think about it, that nothing propels a believer's maturity and effectiveness in the kingdom of God faster than learning to be unselfish. It's that selfless mentality. So let's shift gears here in just a second. One of the, probably the greatest chapters in the whole Bible on generosity is a chapter that Paul wrote to the local church in 2 Corinthians chapter 9. So we're going to flip there together and kind of unpack this this morning. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 6 through 10. The whole chapter is really on Paul talking about generosity, but we're just going to focus on uh, these main four verses here. But he was, Paul was talking to this church. He was saying, you know what? You guys need to be helping other churches. You need to be helping people in need. He was encouraging this church to be generous and not to just be self-focused. Verse 6, it says this, remember this, a farmer who plants only a few seeds will get a small crop, but the one who plants generously will get a generous crop. You must each decide in your heart how much to give, and don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure. So Paul says in scripture here, He's saying to us, be careful, don't, number one, don't give reluctantly, but he also says don't give in response to pressure. Like we talked about earlier, we don't want that. We don't want people feeling like, oh, I I have to do this. But he says, Paul goes on, he says, for God loves a person who gives cheerfully. And God will generously provide all you need. Then you will always have everything you need and plenty left over to share with others. As scriptures say, they share freely and give generously to the poor. Their good deeds will be remembered forever. That's an important thing. Their good deeds will be remembered forever. We're going to talk about that in a little bit here. But verse 10, this is important. For God is the one who provides seed for the farmer and then bread to eat. In the same way, he will provide and increase your resources and then produce a great harvest of generosity in you. So Paul is saying that when a person plants generously, they will get a generous crop. Now, this is where people take and they'll twist Scripture and they'll say, if you are generous to God, if you give enough, God will multiply it and give it all where? Back to you. That's what people like to hear, right? So they go, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give more than I even have. I'm going to take out a loan. I'm going to give all kinds of money to someone with the belief that God is going to somehow, listen, can I just tell you a secret here? God's not a slot machine. God's not a slot machine. You can't just write checks and then, come on, God, yeah. Like, it just doesn't work that way. 
But it says here, guys, that God will produce a great harvest of generosity in you. You see, he guarantees that our seed that is sown with generosity can, will turn into many. That God also says he loves a cheerful giver when we give. But that doesn't automatically mean that if you give in the offering, that multiplied amount will come back to you. But a multiplied amount will be dispersed throughout the kingdom. And guys, I believe that we have seen that in incredible ways through WCAG over decades. We have seen people give even small portioned amounts that have been multiplied and God has used in powerful ways to see people's lives transformed in an amazing way. You see, I believe that when God asks us to sow, like this sowing principle here, that the reaping ends up multiplying into the kingdom of God. Guys, in 2013, um, we as a church took a big step of faith and believed that God was calling us to build a larger building. Our, our church building was just the cafe, if you know kind of the building right now, the cafe and the chapel was all, uh, all that, what our church was at that point. In 2013, we believed that God was calling us to, to grow and, and have a bigger building, and we were going to expand the building that we currently had to three times the size to facilitate the growth. And in that, we had this puzzle that we put up on the, on the, on the stage, and the puzzle slogan was, be a part of the miracle. Anyone remember the puzzle? Is there anyone here this morning? Yeah, quite a few people. You remember the puzzle? It was so exciting. Each month, we would take, receive one offering for puzzle pieces, and each puzzle piece was worth $10,000, and, and the next Sunday, we would celebrate, and we'd put all these puzzle pieces in, and so our goal was ultimately was to pay for the building on the first Sunday that we sat in this room together, and on that Sunday, God did something absolutely incredible. Um, it was, it was a, an amazing show of generosity and sacrifice by our congregation. And we said, you know what? We're believing God for an incredible uh, miracle. And we had a miracle offering that Sunday morning. And we received uh, uh, an offering of the highest offering in our church history of $365,000 in one offering that morning. It was absolutely incredible. I mean, like nothing I'd ever heard of or even dreamt of. And uh, it was incredible. The building, we had paid off 90% of the building up to that point. Uh, we still had about 10% left that we needed to pay. Over the next year and a half, people continued to be generous, continued to say, we haven't crossed the finish line. People continued to give, and we were able to become debt-free uh, in a year and a half uh, after walking into this building, which was incredible. Guys, it's so amazing to me because when I think about this, Many churches take on huge debt loads in order to build and grow, and they take huge debt loads, and sometimes they carry a debt for 30 and 40 years. My home church growing up, I remember when they, when they built their building, they had an incredible debt load for, for, many, for decades, for like 30, over 30 years. And the reason why is because at a church, there's not a lot of extra resources. You're kind of going day to day to make everything work, and, and there isn't a lot of extra resources to put towards debt. And so for God to help retire that debt, the giving the, re, the generosity of our, of our congregation in those moments, giving that generosity and God multiplying it and us seeing this incredible thing, God positioned us to advance the kingdom in powerful ways. And that's where we got to a place in 2014 where we believe that we started on this incredible journey of generosity as a church. And we call it our 2030 vision. And um, I won't go into great details about our 2030 vision because in two weeks we're going to talk about missions and that's when we're really going to focus on our 2030 vision. But I, I'm going to tell you about this, guys. We believe that God wanted us as a church to be debt-free so that we could take the extra resources uh, that, that we would receive in the offerings and we would rapidly advance the gospel of Jesus Christ. So our 2030 vision is we believe as a church that by the year, in the year 2030, God will help us to impact every country of the world in one of three ways. Either we will plant a church, or we will support a missionary, or we will do a project that rapidly advances the gospel in every country of the world. And guys, I'm really excited. In two weeks, I'm going to tell you what number we're on since 2014, how many countries we've impacted. I won't give it away this Sunday, but just uh, to encourage you to come back in two weeks to hear about that. But guys, since that vision started, 
every time we pass the Kentucky Fried chicken, uh, chicken buckets, every time we do that, we pass them around. Whenever you give in one of those, I want you to understand, if you give in, into one of those buckets, a portion of that offering goes somewhere in the world to advance the gospel of Jesus Christ. It doesn't just stay here. It doesn't just keep the lights on. Every single offering, there's a portion of it that goes to advance the gospel in a powerful way. And so guys, we're really excited about generosity at our church. Guys, I want you to understand that since we had this vision in 2014, we have used the proceeds of those offerings. And right now, as of right now, we have planted over 60 churches overseas thanks to the generosity of WCAG. Isn't that amazing? Praise God. Over 60 churches, not to mention missionaries, not to mention projects that we do. Every single month, the board decides what country we're gonna impact. So monthly, we're impacting a different country in the world just because of your generosity. Guys, I want to look at verse 10 again. If we can have that on the screen again, and you guys can look at it. It says, For God is the one who provides seed for the farmer and then bread to eat. In the same way, he will provide and increase your resources and then produce a great harvest of generosity in you. Guys, just like Paul told the Corinthian church, we have seen how God has provided in supernatural financial ways We also, as a church, have seen God increase people's giving, increase people's resources. We've seen a greater harvest of generosity than we could have ever imagined. And we have watched as families at WCAG and individuals have given generously to advance the gospel of Jesus Christ. Guys, we love missionaries at WCAG. We've had missionaries come and speak, and not so much in COVID, that was a little challenging, uh, but guys, there are many missionaries that say to me, Pastor Sheldon, this, your church is so generous. That's one of the things that they say. Your church is so generous. They've blessed us in such powerful ways. And Guys, I, I, I just, I'm blown away, I'm blown away at your generosity. Like, one of the things that I purposely do is I don't tell you when we're having a missionary, okay? I do that on purpose, it's strategic, um, and they just show up, and you're like, oh, hey, we're having a missionary today. And they're going to they're gonna share from their heart about what God's doing in Estonia or Dominican Republic or something to that effect. And they begin to share. And a lot of times we'll say, you know what, we want to support their, missionary or their mission and what they're doing. And we're going to receive an offering at the close of the service. And so we pass the chicken buckets again. And people throw their money in. And oftentimes, guys, it's so amazing for me to watch. Is there are many people who don't come prepared. And they go, man... I really want to be generous. And I've literally watched people run out of the sanctuary and run to their vehicles and grab checkbooks and write checks. I've watched people in first service go home and come back to second service just so they can give in the offering at the close of the service. We've seen people come in on Monday mornings with checkbooks to write checks. We've had people give incredible amounts of money online giving just because they say, you know what, we want to be a part of the gospel advancing in this way. And guys, we've seen so many times where missionaries are so blessed. One of my favorite stories about uh, a missionary, there was a young lady from our church here who was sensing the call to missions, and she was going to go um, to a country, and she needed to go to school, and she actually turned down a full-ride scholarship to NDSU to fulfill the mission that God had for her. She went to a private school, and it was going to cost her about $10,000 for that training, and I remember that Sunday, we got done with the service, and she shared her heart, and I said, guys, we're going to pass the buckets again today, and we're going to believe God to supply for this young lady And we passed all the buckets, and God did an incredible thing that day. People gave generously. And I just remember hearing one story that back in the chapel, this was back when we were in the chapel, they went upstairs to count the offering in one of the rooms, and all of a sudden, there were two men that were standing outside of the door of the the room as they were counting the offering. And one man said to the other man, he says, why are you here? And the guy pulled out his checkbook, and he said, if the offering's not enough, I'm writing the check for the rest. The other man pulled his checkbook out and he said, I'll split it with you. 
Guys, that's the kind of church that we have. That's the generosity where people say, this is, we believe in what God is doing. And guys, I, I love to share those type of stories and, and just to show you the generosity because guys, remember, generosity is not just about money. Generosity is about the heart. And you guys, as a congregation, WCAG has this incredible heart to invest in the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ around the world. And we have always said, that, that we'll build churches and we don't want any credit. We'll send missionaries and we don't want credit. We don't, we don't care whatever it is. We're gonna do whatever it takes. We don't need our name on a plaque. We don't need to put the whoosh in a piece of concrete uh, underneath the church or something like that. We're just gonna anonymously, people will never know that WCAG did what they did. And guys, you know, it's so incredible because we've had that mindset literally for decades that it's not about us. But last year, something happened that, um, that I need to tell you guys about. That in 2019, we had our year of multiplication where we were, we were doing incredible things and, and planting churches all over the world. Uh, we believed that God would have us plant one church per month in a different country for the year of 2019. And we gave radically that, that year. And then 2020 hit, and we weren't able to meet as uh, district pastors or network pastors of the Assemblies of God. And then this year in 2021, when we met together, they were doing announcements for all of these awards and different things that were going on throughout the North Dakota Assemblies of God. And Pastor Dustin and I were talking with each other, we're sitting by each other, and I'm not really paying much attention, I apologize, I was just, we were chatting. And all of a sudden they said, they said, we want to give a, a, a special plaque this morning for the highest giving church in 2019 because we did not, weren't able to do that in 2020. And so they said, we would like to give the church that gave the most to missions in the state of North Dakota in the Assemblies of God is, and then all of a sudden they said, Watford City Assembly of God. And I was like, what? It's a Dustin? And yeah, that's awesome. And so I'm sitting here going, you mean to tell me like, you know, like all of these other big churches and all these bigger communities and all of those type of things. And they said, Wofford City Assembly of God gave the most to missions in the year 2019. But guys, it was absolutely incredible. I have the plaque to prove it. We're not about plaques, but it's sitting in my office. We don't even have it hanging up anywhere. But we're just saying, you know what? It's about advancing the kingdom of God. But I got to tell you guys this, because it goes further than that. The incredible generosity of WCAG, I got a letter from the headquarters of the Assemblies of God in all of America, in the United States. They said, WCAG, we just want to let you know, Pastor, we want to thank you for your generosity. He said, WCAG has, um, is in the top 100 churches in the nation in the Assemblies of God for giving. In fact, out of all 12,000 churches in America in the Assemblies of God, WCAG is the 54th most generous church when it comes to missions. Isn't that incredible? So I'm just sitting here going, that is absolutely, in my mind, I'm just blown away. But guys, here's the thing. This is, I don't tell you that to get a big head because we really haven't advertised this. This happened a little while ago and it isn't something that we, we blow our horn or we dress up and walk and give our offering or something like that. That's not what we're like. That's not our, our, the way we go. What, why I'm telling you this, guys, is I believe that generosity breeds generosity. And when we understand that we are a generous church, that is part of the building block. That is part of the DNA of who we are. I believe that leads to even greater giving. And you guys have proved that and shown, even in a downturn, guys, when churches were closing their doors, guys, we saw people give sacrificially, give generously, and continue to see God impact people's lives, both in this community and in Fairview, Montana. So guys, we, I just want to thank you guys for being incredibly generous. You're an incredibly generous church, and it's contagious. And what it shows me is that you have a selfless heart and a compassion for other people, and God loves generosity. Guys, there's one more thing I want to talk to you about, and then we're going to tie up today. It's a term that we've coined over the last two weeks. We just kind of came up with it. Titus and I came up with this. We were talking. We talked about generational generosity. 
I've never read it in a book. I've never heard about it before. But when I thought about WCAG, I thought, you know what? There's something special about the generosity at WCAG. It's generational generosity. Let's look at one more passage of Scripture, and I want to show this to you guys. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 17 through 19, it says this. It says, teach those who are rich in this world not to be proud and not to trust in their money, which is so unreliable. Let's stop there for just a second. If you live in America today, regardless of what your tax form says of how much money you make in a year, you live in like the top at least five, if not two percentile of the richest people on the face of the planet, okay? Regardless of what you make in a year. So let's just, let's just admit we're all rich for today, right now, all right? Don't, don't you already feel good? You came to church and found out you were rich. So that, that's great. So it says, teach those people who are rich. That's what it says here in Scripture. Teach the people who are rich in this world not to be proud and not to trust in their money because it's so unreliable. Their trust should be in what? It should be in God, who richly gives us all we need for our enjoyment, Tell them to use their money to do good. They should be rich in good works and generous to those in need, always being ready to share with others. By doing this, they will be storing up their treasure as a good foundation for the future so that they may experience true life. Guys, it says they are storing up a treasure as a good foundation for the future. Guys, that's what we call generational generosity. That our trust should not be in our money, but it should be in God. That we use our money to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous to those in need, to share with other people. And when we are generous, it lays this foundation for the future. See, often people think, they get confused and they think, I'm going to give because they think of what they can get from it, what they can reap in the reward. But what if you never see the impact of your generosity. Are you okay with that? That's the question I had to ask you today. Is that if you will never see the impact of your generosity, are you okay with that? What if your generosity blesses your children? What if your generosity blesses your grandchildren? What if your generosity blesses a stranger that you will never meet on this side of heaven? Are you okay with that? I see a lot of people shaking their heads, yes. That, that encourages me. Because guys, generos generational generosity is when people know that they are investing their lives in others. Guys, we sit in this room this morning because there was a group of people many, many years ago that believed in this. I was reading, I was looking through some files this week. I don't even know why it happened. I, maybe it was being led by the Holy Spirit, but all of a sudden I pulled out this file about our church history and I found this old letter from Pastor Bill Bush was, was kind of like our founding pastor here at WCAG. And in that letter, he wrote about these six families that sacrificed greatly and those six men actually going to the bank, local bank here, and signing their name on a note so that they could build the first church, which is the cafe here. And there are people who literally, there are people sitting in this room this morning. You don't know who they are. You've just watched them all these years. They've just been that person that sits in your section. Some of those people, their names were on those things. They still go to this church. Some of them have passed away. But I want you to understand, guys, that we sit in the shade of the trees that were planted many decades ago. We are reaping the generational generosity of people many years ago. And many of the people that sit in this room today, I look across this room, there are people that generationally, for years and years, you have invested in the kingdom of God through WCAG, and we are seeing the multiplied blessing of people's lives transformed in a powerful way. Guys, as we talked about earlier, we've seen generational generosity. Who would have thought, as we sat in the, 
in the little cafe area at the church when the church was just this little building that God could use that little group of people and their generational generosity to plant 60 churches around the world, to plant another congregation in Fairview, Montana, to impact people's lives in powerful ways through the internet every Sunday as people are listening, even this morning, online. Guys, it's so incredible. That's what we talk about in generational generosity. I want to share with you a couple stories about generational generosity, and then we're going to tie up this morning. The first one, we were at the Fairview campus for the big sneak peek where we had a bunch of people come over and celebrate as we were launching our campus. And I got up in front, and I wanted to thank everyone. Guys, thank you for your generosity. Thank you for investment and believing that God could impact other communities through WCAG. And at that point... I said, you know what, the sanctuary here, it seats between 80 and 90 people. That's what it was. A lady came up to me after the service and she said, Pastor Sheldon, that's so incredible. And when you said 80 to 90 people, it just hit me in my heart. Because she said, I remember the first few weeks that we came to WCAG. We went into the small little chapel. This was many years ago, a couple decades. She said, when my husband and I came to this community, we found this little church. And she said, on a great Sunday... There'd be about 80 or 90 people. And she said, when you said that, she said it struck a chord in my heart because she said, I have literally watched my church go full circle and see that God could use us to plant another life-giving church in another community just like this life-giving church was for us. She said, that so impacted my heart and my life. And guys, it's so amazing to see WCAG impact rural communities and communities around the world in powerful ways. Let's have our worship team come at this time, and I'm going to share one personal story about generational generosity today. I didn't know my grandfather, uh, Grandpa McGorman, who was my father's dad. Um, He passed away when I was in elementary school. I have very few memories about my grandfather, uh, but he was an incredible picture of generational generosity I just remember my grandfather, the few memories that I have of my grandfather was he was a very simple farmer. He was an airplane mechanic in the war. He built his own house with his own two hands because that's just what you did back then. I remember looking at my grandfather's hands when he would come in for lunch after working all day on the farm, or all morning on the farm, come in for lunch, and he would wash his hands and they would still be stained almost black with grease. The cracks in his hands would just have so much on him from the hard work and the calloused hands that he had. I just remember those hands. There's something about them that was so amazing to me. I used to tell, i say, Grandma, send Grandpa back to wash his hands. They're not clean. The only time I ever saw those hands even close to clean were Sunday mornings when he would sit at the scrub basin and scrub his hands as long as he could to try and get all of the grease and, the, and all of the hard work out of, his, out of those cracks in his hands. But I didn't know my grandfather. He passed away when I was in uh, probably about fifth grade, I think it was. And so I didn't know my grandfather very well. Many years later, I heard a story about my grandfather that impacted my life. Um, He he got saved and started attending a, a small Pentecostal church just in a rural community. And God was touching his life and his family in a powerful way. And they asked one day, they said, you know, we need some people that would be willing to help work at this camp that is, the Assemblies of God has, or a Pentecostal Assemblies of Canada has. And they said, you know, we, we need some people to go and move all of these cabins onto this campground so that people can start coming to this campground and hearing about Jesus and, and their lives can be impacted with the gospel. And my grandfather, he said, well, I, I can't do much. I'm not much of a speaker. And I don't know, but I, I, can, I can help move cabins. I know how to do that. And so he helped out and took a few days and they moved all of these cabins onto this camp. And he did this um, many decades. Um, I, I don't know what years it would have been that he would have done this. But my grandfather passed away and a couple years later I was in junior high and I walked onto that campground to go to camp one summer. And I, sat, and I, and I stayed in the cabins that my grandfather had, had helped seat on that camp. I stayed in those cabins, and that week, God got a hold of my life in a powerful way. I came down to the altar and accepted Jesus Christ as my personal Lord and Savior, and that was my all-in moment. A year later at that same camp, God touched my life in a powerful way and called me into full-time ministry. And I know 
that many people in the room, you would say, well, Pastor Sheldon, I can't really connect the dots very well there, you know. Yeah, your grandpa, he helped put some cabins up or different things like that, but how can you connect the dots on that? And guys, here's, this is how I connect the dots. You see, my grandfather had passed away, but on those nights that I gave my life to Jesus Christ and later was called into ministry, some might say all he did was move in cabins. But the way I see it, my grandfather's generational generosity positioned me to experience God in a very special way to which I am eternally grateful. And my grandfather never knew that. The question I asked you this morning was this, are you willing to be generous even if you never see who it impacts? Because it might be your grandchildren. Guys, I believe that I stand here today because of that summer camp, that God touched my life in such a powerful way. I'm very thankful for the generational generosity that my grandfather gave. And so guys, this morning, this is how we're gonna land the plane. You see, we're gonna sing a song today, but as we're singing, I want you to begin to pray. I want you to begin to ask God. I want you to begin to say, God, give me a generous heart. God, give me a heart that is selfless and helpful. Give me a heart that reaches out to others, a heart that invests in generational type generosity. That's what I desire today, Jesus. That's what we wanna do. Why don't you stand this morning, guys, and as we close in song this morning, Pastor Dustin has an important message that he's gonna share right after about generational generosity, and we want you guys to catch that. But we're gonna worship God, we're gonna ask God to allow us to be generous, and then he's gonna come up and tie up the service today.
Of the goodness.